Hey everybody, welcome back to Young Engineers of Today. How was everybody's weekend? Was it decent, good, fun, relaxing, boring, full of adventure? Oh, well, mine was pretty good. Thanks for asking. I uh, actually had a, a day off. That was wonderful. Uh, pretty okay. Is It's not bad. It's not bad. Things could be a lot worse than pretty okay. Um, all right. Seems like things were, on the whole, not terrible, which is good. Uh, we are going to continue with the Godot engine today, uh, to nobody's surprise. So hopefully you guys are ready to go with that. I figured out what I was doing wrong with the uh, Hello World and got that fixed. We'll spend some time talking about what's going on with the code and everything like that and uh, help illustrate sort of the relationship between the nodes and everything. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about JavaScript's node library because the scripting language used in Godot is very similar to it. That's very similar to JavaScript in general and they use something that is very similar to, to node.js. So we'll spend some time talking about that too. And then we will get started on, if you know, there's probably going to be time for it, but we will get started on like a Pong game. It should be a very, um, very small download, like we're just going to download some assets, and uh, and then we'll we'll create a new project, put those in, and we'll get started on that, all that stuff. So, yeah, let me go ahead and, and get uh, Gado started up. So this should look pretty familiar to you guys. Um, the project window and we've got our first button, hello world, on all that good stuff. So we'll go ahead and get that started up. Spend some time thinking about things and stuff. And hopefully all of this stuff should still be pretty fresh in your minds. If not, that's fine. It's been some time uh, going over it again. You guys remember we've got, we're looking at a 2D view of everything. So we've got this rectangle here, which is meant to represent our game window or our whatever window. So if I hit play, as you can see, it pretty well mimics. In fact, it is just about the same exact size as the uh, window we've got here. So we'll go ahead and close this real quick. But we spent some time talking about nodes and uh, in the Godot environment and what those meant. And basically, if you guys remember, uh, nodes are just sort of like discrete um, objects in this. So we have a node which represents the panel, which is the window that we have. That's one node. And all that node is is just just our window. So let's do window. And all that's meant to represent is just the little window that all this stuff is on, or the panel, I suppose. So it's like kind of like a pop-up window. We've got a couple of children on that because if you guys remember, nodes can be organized thusly. And we can have children. So we might have one, in our case we've got label, and we've also got button. These are both children of window. Whatever we do with window, or I guess in this case panel, excuse me, not window, panel. Let's not confuse our terminology here. Yeah. Nothing is in it. Oh, it must not have saved. I forgot that point about Godot. It's one of the one of the issues it has is the fact that it doesn't actually save it unless it expl you explicitly tell it to. So it's not like Word or something like that where it will it can automatically 
save periodically and also ask you when you quit if you want to save it again. So that's fine. Let's go ahead and um, we'll get started from the, uh, the beginning here then. So just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to grab all of this code and get it saved on the thing. There we go. So yeah, we'll, we'll delete all this stuff and just start over anew as if, uh, as if we had a blank project. And that will be our review. That way everybody can get caught up as well in case it, it didn't save because that, that was a thing I learned the hard way the first time around too. So our editor window, if you guys remember, yeah, no problem. This is the view screen. We've got our file system down here, which is always tied to the um, the folder that we created this in. So if you guys remember, we created it inside of a blank folder so it didn't spend all this time trying to import a bunch of stuff that it wouldn't necessarily understand. There are still a few strangenesses to, to Godot. Um, we've got our scene editor up here, which allows us to change everything that we've got in our scene. And we've got our inspector over here on the right hand side which allows us to change pretty much any sort of aspect of anything that we have selected. It's kind of like the inspector window in Unity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add a new node to our scene which um, again is just a node can be anything. It can be like the panel that we had, it can be the button on the panel, it can be a character, it can be an animation, it can be a skybox, it can be music, it can be a projectile fired out of a, you know, uh, a cannon, it can be uh, particle effects on a rocket ship, it's whatever. It's, nodes are anything and everything in the Godot engine. So what we're going to do is we're going to click this little page up here in the scene uh, window, or the scene area in order to create a new node. And that's what we did in order to add any of our new nodes. Now if you guys remember, do you guys, rem well, let me let me phrase it this way, do you guys remember the difference between the different colors? And you can also spend some time looking over them to see if it can give you any clues as to what the difference between the different colors are. Exactly, 2D, 3D, and something. It's <laughs> pretty much exactly that, yeah. Uh, red represents 3D-based nodes, so stuff for the 3D engine. You've got, you know, uh, collision meshes, you've got ray casts, you've got lighting, um, 3D models, things like that. Uh, blue represents 2D, so you've got sprites, um, particle uh, effects, uh, kinematic and, and rigid body physics engines, phys physics engine stuff, uh, light sources, light occlusion, uh, camera, stuff like that. Um, the, the yellow is for, for animation. Uh, the white is for sound. Um, well, there's also, there's also in-engine stuff that's, that's white under the uh, 2D engine area. And then green is all UI. UI and UX, so stuff that the user would interact with, windows and things like that. So what we're going to do, or it's, it's also known as the control um, aspect, or control nodes. What we're going to do is we're going to create a new panel. And a panel is basically just a blank window. I mean, it doesn't get any simpler than a panel. A panel is just this, and that's it. So let's go ahead and... Boop, 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 boop. Create our panel roughly the size of our of our um, thingamajig, our viewport, and that will be our window where all of this magic happens. Now, um, I can deselect the panel and add a new node or anything like that. But what we're going to do is we're going to keep the panel selected in our uh, in our scene view. And the reason for that is any new nodes we add are going to be children of the panel when we when we do this. Children of the panel, which is a lesser well-known Stephen King novel. Oh, terrible joke. Anyway, um, if we keep the panel selected, any new nodes we add are going to be children of that panel node. 
which is something we want right now. We want the button and the label to be children of that panel node. So we're going to create a new node. And now we can go, we can scroll through all this stuff and try and find it. We can also search for stuff up here. But for now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll up and I'm going to select the button. It's just plain old button. Nothing special about button. Regular, regular button. And now I can expand it so I've got this big old button in the middle here. Sort of spend a little bit of time trying to center it. And then, see now that's our button. Then we can go over here to the inspector window and check out some of the stuff we have. Uh, so we can change the anchoring of the uh, text, so the margins and things like that. We can change the, uh, the area that we have where the button is. We can tell the uh, tell the engine that the button will be disabled at least until a certain point so that we can re-enable the button. Uh, if you've ever played incremental games um, like Adventure Capitalist or um, Kitten's Game or anything like that, you know, sometimes something will be deselected because you can't afford it. Something like that, you know? Uh, so you can keep a button disabled until such a point when you determine that the user can click the button and you can re-enable it. You can uh, have it be a toggle button as opposed to just a press button. Uh, we can we can just say that the button is always pressed. So we can turn it on and the button will be pressed. So if it's toggled, we can we can say that it's pressed. You can't do that on a, on a regular one because obviously if if it operates like a normal button, like an OK button or a, you know the um, like the back button on your browser or something like that. It's kind of counterproductive to have it always be pressed. Um, we can have it click upon press, stuff like that. Um, we can have it ignore the mouse, so you can only click it, basically, or you can only uh, press it with the keyboard. Um, although that, again, is a little counter counterproductive. If we have any themes, we can add a theme to it. Uh, we can add custom styles, so like when you mouse over it, it lights up. When you press it, it um, turns green. Uh, when you have focus on it, it has like a line around it. When it's disabled, it's it's a you know a dark red color, stuff like that. We can give it a custom font. Uh, a lot of that stuff is is generally for like user experience stuff. So if you want to customize the the interface of your game more to make it you know more appealing to the uh, to the eye, you're more than welcome to do that. We're gonna worry about this text field up here because we're going to fill the, the text field with something and we're going to say hi computer you are now alive why I don't know but that's what we're going to do we're going to say hi computer you are now alive at least that's what I'm going to say you can say whatever you want and uh, we're going to make sure it's aligned on the center of the button we can align it to the left or to the right but that doesn't look nearly as good. It looks kind of strange. So we're going to keep it center aligned. So now we've got our panel and we've got a button, which is the child of the panel. And now we're going to add the label. The label is just straight up text on the screen. Um, we could actually put label anywhere. We don't have to put it on the panel. However, the panel provides a nice backing for everything. Um, makes it easier to read the stuff on the label. So we're going to, we're going to, you know, we're going to add the label onto the panel, which is why we did that. But it's it, straight up, it's just text on the screen. It's not anchored to anything in particular. It can display anywhere. Um, that is one of the, the, the easy things about labels. It just sort of, it can go anywhere. Now, remember, we're going to have to click on panel again before we add this new node. Because if we have button still selected, if we create the label, it's going to be a child of button. Which is not a huge deal. But... Um, it requires a little bit more coding on the scripting side, or I say a little bit, it's like literally one more word, but, um, it's good practice to, ow, uh, it's good practice to organize everything by, um, basically the, how you want everything to interact. So since we want everything in this to be associated with the panel, it's good practice to make sure that it's all children of the panel and not children of, you know, some sort of weird, uh, we, we, it's good to make sure we don't have some sort of weird hierarchy that's not really intended. So I'm going to click on panel and create a new node. And I'm just going to show off the search feature real quick and do a search for label. 
and there it is, label. It just and the little icon even says label. It's just a super super duper plain one. A rich text label would allow us to to do you know bold and italics and you know use all kinds of crazy fonts and change the color of the font and you know whatever, which would be nice if we were so inclined, but for now we're just going to stick with the very, very basic plain text label. It's going to be easier for us to work with, and uh, it's going to be just a very simple thing. So we're going to set up label so it's somewhere in this area, and then just under the, uh, the inspector, we're going to make sure that it's center aligned and vertically aligned with the center as well. Um, a few, of the, a few of these other things, like auto wrap, will make sure that the text wraps around in case it's too long for the label, which would be quite the essay if we, you know, managed to have a hello world that required text wrapping. Um, clipping the text, if it's too long, rather than having it run over, it will end at the end of the label, which can be a problem you might run into if you have something displaying like ever increasing numbers, and eventually the number gets too large for the label. If you don't have text clipping. Uh, that number will spill out outside of the label and start running all over your user interface, which may not be the best thing. Um, generally, it looks a lot neater to have the text clipped to the size of the label, but if you run into an issue where um, you don't have enough space to display everything, uh, you know, you might have some outside case where there's a really long block of text that's shown, and if it gets clipped, then that also might look bad, and if you've accounted for that space in your UI, that sort of thing. Uppercase will constrain everything to be uppercase, so even if you type in lowercase letters uh, in text up here, if you click uppercase, it will automatically make all of the letters uppercase. Again, can be useful for certain things to make sure that everything is, is nice and, and um, unified, I suppose is a word that I'm looking for. You can have it ignore the mouse so they can't fiddle around with the label, which is generally a good thing to have just sort of on for stuff like labels so that they can't like drag it around or interact with it, highlight the text. Because um, it always looks kind of bad if your user can highlight your text in the middle of a game. So for that reason, we have stuff like ignore mouse on. Um, we're not going to worry about fonts somewhat, uh, you know, counterintuitively. We're not going to worry about fonts or anything like that for label. Um, we're just going to keep it the basic, you know, basic Godot font. Um, and we're going to keep text blank. We're actually going to have label be more or less functionally invisible until we want it to say something. So now we've got our interface. We've got panel, button, and label. Now, do you guys remember how to add a script? Control A. Actually, that adds a new node. Although I like that, yeah. But yeah, there is there is also script mode. Um, that's a really easy way to do it. Um, if you if you still have a script, you can just click on the script button up here, and it'll bring you over to the scripts. And as you can see, my hello world script is still here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to attach a script to this panel by clicking this button right here. It looks like a scroll, and it says edit slash create the node script. Um, I'm going to use my hello world since it's already been, well, yeah, okay, we'll overwrite it. So I'm not going to use my hello world. Create, why is the, yeah, I know, I wanted me to, fine, we'll call it hello world one. There we go. You guys can just call it hello world uh, if you don't have one already. I'm calling it hello world one because I can't overwrite um, my original hello world. But this is perfect. This allows us to see uh, all of the scripting that we have. So basic bare bones script that is created with anything is going to look like this. It's going to extend. Ah, yes. Sorry, I didn't really spend time explaining that. I apologize. So let me um, go back into 2D mode. Okay, so for instance, if I were to create a script for the button, which I'm not going to, but if I were to. Um, class name always stays empty. 
Um, Tab deep link, uh, we'll address that in a moment. Uh, under path though, you want to make sure, if you click these two buttons next to it, you want to make sure it's in your, oh yeah, yeah, for now, unless something's created. Um, so all we're going to interact with in this case is going to be path. So if you click on these two buttons here, you get to browse the window or browse the um, project area. Uh, by default, it goes to the RES area, which again, is the resource path. It's a shortcut to the resource path that Godot uses. RES, short for resource. Um, from here, you create a .gd script, short for uh, Godot. Um, give it a name, and then click Save. So as you can see, I've got Hello World and Hello World 1 here, so I could call it like, you know, uh, my first script .gd and hit Save. And as you can see, the path lights up with res colon forward slash forward slash my first script dot gd. And then it says path is valid down here. Then when you click create, uh, you should have a new script created in the script window. So when you say your, your script tab is blank, uh, you mean like you don't have any of this stuff over here on the left hand side? Um, like you don't have a script listed there? It's not necessarily going to be hello world and hello world one, but there might be something listed there. If not, it just basically it just means that you haven't created a script yet. Okay, uh, over here on the far left hand side under scene, do you have any little scroll icons next to any of your nodes? Okay, that's fine. That's easily fixable. You just need to uh, when you when you create, just make sure you know. Again, whoops. Yeah, well, that, that means to look at it. So I'll just make sure you put something in here. And uh, again, just click the, the double button, give it a name, hit save, and it should automatically fill out with the path, which is where it's going to be saved. Um, and if it says path is valid, then you can click create. And then you should have something there. But you're going to want to do it for panel, not for button. That's uh, just the only caveat. I can't do it for panel right now because I've already created a script for it. Okay, excellent. So now we should have something listed here. Um, for me, I've got two scripts listed here. Uh, you guys are probably only going to have one. But... Uh, I just want to go over the scripting again. So, again, bare bones example of a script. Anytime you create a script, it's gonna it's gonna have this information. In it. You're gonna have the extends, whatever. In this case, panel, um, and then you're gonna have function ready. So, what exactly is happening here? Well, extends is a keyword for inheritance, and then panel. Obviously, it's extending whatever it's attached to. In this case, it's attached to the panel. So it's extending all of the functions that are built into the panel node in Godot. Because everything, everything in Godot, all of the stuff, the animated sprites, the buttons, the music, the uh, raycast, the, the point light, the you know collision bodies, all that stuff is going to have scripting built into it. It's going to have, it's, in the background, it's going to have its own functions that um, can be called and run and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it's all going to be specific to that thing. So, you know, like a rigid body is going to have functions built in that allow it to uh, react appropriately in case it collides with something else. Point light is going to have appropriate scripts built into it in order to shine light on other things and uh, sort of draw lines that create light. Um, you know, a button script is going to have uh, functions built in that detect when it's being pressed and uh, 
detect when it's you know uh, available to be clicked on and things like that. What extends does is extends utilizes a uh, uh, an idea called inheritance. And this is something that is fairly common to really any object-oriented programming language. And it's actually, it's kind of kind of a neat idea. So uh, have I waxed philosophical about object-oriented programming languages yet to you guys? Because I know that's a thing I can get lost on for, you know, 20 minutes. And if it, <laughs> if I already have, then, uh, you know, there's no sense in me wasting another 20 minutes talking about it. Okay, so maybe I haven't talked about it before. All right, so programming, programming languages come in many different shapes and sizes, um, but you can divide them into two sort of camps, among other things. One of them is a procedural programming language or a, uh, a prescriptive or something like that, and another one is object-oriented. Now, the former, the either procedural or, or uh, regimented or whatever you want to call it, you can think of it like um, a list of instructions that, like, you, you know, you get something from Ikea and it's like step one, attach screw to this, step two, do this, step three, do this, step four, do this, step five, do this, blah, 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 blah. Um, or like a... Uh, Kind of like maybe like a grocery list, in in the sense that it's a it's a very it's a line by line, very regimented uh, programming sort of doctrine. Uh, you would basic is a very good example of this. One hundred print hello. This is it would actually be ten and twenty, not one hundred and two hundred. So delete that, and then twenty go to ten. This is an incredibly simple example of something like that. You look, you just have lines, and you might move around between the lines, but on the whole, you move from the top to the bottom, and that's how the program runs. So in this case, it would print hello, and then it would go to 20, and then it would say go back to 10, and it would go back to 10 and do the instruction at 10, print hello, 20, go back to 10, blah, 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 um, over and over and over again. So basically, this program, all it does is it just prints hello on the screen until the computer crashes. Um, or until the heat death of the universe, whatever comes first. Um, incredibly simple program, but in this case, it's a, it's a much it's a much simpler sort of program because it's 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 very much about uh, just executing instructions in a specific order and uh, you know ensuring that everything stays very tightly uh, sort of regimented. Now. This can be a very easy way to learn programming uh, because it's very it's very easy to think about, but it has some disadvantages. Notably, uh, let's say, what if you wanted to use this kind of programming language in order to write a game? And in this game, you know, you have enemies that spawn. Well, what happens if you have many enemies? What happens if you wanted to spawn more enemies? What happens if you wanted to like to, to create enemies on demand whenever there's an issue? Well, or whenever you know you want to, to make things more difficult for the player. Well, you run into a problem there because you'll have things like maybe you'll have a variable to control the monster's health uh, to keep track of it. Maybe you'll have a variable to keep track of how much damage the monster does. Uh, which is all well and good if you have like one monster in the game. You just have like monster health and uh, monster attack. We'll just call it MH and MA. Um, monster health and monster attack. That's fine. One monster he uses these. You know, maybe he has 100 health and his attack does five damage. And if you wanted two monsters, monster health, two, monster attack. Two, maybe he has 150 health, and he deals 15 damage because he's like way stronger than the other guy. All right, so far so good. Let's add a third one. I want a third monster in my game. Monster health three, monster attack three. You can see how this would start getting wildly out of control. 
because you would have to have variables and behavior implemented separately for each monster in the game, every single one of them. And it would be very difficult in order to implement these on the fly. Say you wanted to add a new one. <laughs> I mean, you'd have to hard code it in, or you'd have to code in something that would create stuff um, like that would modify the code on the fly. Or maybe anytime a, a new monster is created, it's going to use this monster health. But it, otherwise, it's going to require some hard coding, and it's going to be very, 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 very annoying and time-consuming in order to do. Well, object-oriented programming is sort of built on the idea that everything in the world can be modeled with these things that are um, imaginatively called objects. Uh, because programming, by and large, is all about simulating the world uh, in the most uh, understandable, and maybe not always the easiest way, but in the most uh, sort of relatable way possible. So, you can, if you want to think about the world from a programming perspective, the world is filled with stuff. And stuff can be tangible or intangible, it doesn't really matter, but stuff is always going to be uh, characterized by certain things. Maybe this stuff has properties to it. Maybe this stuff can do things. And really, those are the two major um, sort of ideas which can differentiate stuff, the properties they have and the things they can do. Kind of vague, I know. Let's take an example. Vehicle. A vehicle is an example of stuff, right? A vehicle can be a bicycle, it can be a car, it can be a truck, it can be a plane, it can be a boat, it can be a spaceship, it can be whatever. Now, give me some examples of what kind of properties a vehicle can have. I know it's, it's sort of a out of left field question, but color. Yeah, exactly. A vehicle can have a color. What else you got? Year. Yeah. The year it was made or whatever. Maybe you could you could go even simpler than that. You can be like number of wheels. You could go even simpler than that and say, does it have wheels? You could say, uh let's see here. Can it fly? or um, type of engine. Yeah, number of seats, number of seats. Exactly. All of this stuff can be properties that a vehicle can have. Now, vehicle have, what about vehicle do? What can a vehicle do? Well, a vehicle can presumably move, right? Maybe a vehicle 
Yeah, exactly. Float, try, fly, drive, pedal. Yeah, whatever the case may be. Um, you know, these these can all be under like yeah, like the move. Uh, maybe a vehicle has to be turned on. Maybe a vehicle has to be refueled. Um, maybe a vehicle has to be, or maybe a vehicle can. Um, Let's not do that example. Um, I was going to say maybe a vehicle can explode, but that's probably not the best idea. Uh, maybe a vehicle can... Um, well, certainly it can turn off. If you can turn it on, you can turn it off. All of these things. Now, from a programming perspective, all of this stuff over here... Whoa. And that's what I get for using the mouse wheel while I'm drawing. All of this stuff over here are programming variables. They're all just different kinds of variables that hold this information in the computer. This side over here, they're all functions. They're all that, that regimented side of programming. So here we have two things which can differentiate, can do, can do miles to differentiate different objects from one another. And there's stuff that's already built into programming. You've got variables and you've got functions. Two things that pretty much just make up programming. Now object-oriented programming is all about taking these two things and combining them in some form or another into objects. So an object can be a vehicle, and it can have a variable for color and year and number of wheels and whether or not it has them and whether or not it can fly and the type of engine and the number of seats. And then it can have um, it can have functions which you can call. You can say like, okay, uh, vehicle move, and it will access the move function inside of it and do that stuff. Now this this all may seem very abstract and maybe a little bit harder to understand at this point because we don't really have a a concrete sort of um, example to draw from. But the strength in object-oriented programming now is we can create copies of this object more or less at will. We call them instances. So you can think of this, all of this right here, sort of this, this brainstorming about what a vehicle has and what a vehicle can do as the blueprint for a vehicle. So now the program knows what a vehicle looks like, and we go. We can go in the future. We can go. Okay, create new vehicles. We can create new vehicles. And we'll, you know, maybe tell it what color and what year and all that stuff is. Um, but based on the fact that it is a copy of our vehicle blueprint, it is a cookie cut from our vehicle cookie cutter. It understands that it needs to have a year and a color and a number of wheels and and uh, a type of engine and a number of seats. And it understands that it needs to know how to move and turn on and refuel and turn off. Now, if we were programmers that had the foresight and, and it was directly applicable, we could tell it how a vehicle moves, turns on, refuels, and turns off. So anytime we create a new instance of that vehicle, it will, it will come into existence. It will be born already knowing how to move and turn on and refuel and turn off. So all we have to do is create a new vehicle, and it already has all of this knowledge that we gave it in the beginning. Now, that is sort of the inherent strength of object-oriented programming. Suddenly, all we have to do is we have to create a monster object that has a number of hit points and an attack, and uh, maybe a function or two telling it how to find the hero and how to attack the hero. And we can create as many monsters as we want. We can create as many instances of monsters as we want, and they're all going to have their own hit points, they're all going to have their own you know, attack values, and they're all going to know how to find the hero and attack him without having to manually create new variables in our code. Modern games rely a lot on object-oriented programming. Pretty much any modern game you find is going to be created with some sort of object-oriented program using some sort of, well, I say object-oriented program, um, a program that is conducive to an object-oriented programming style. So Java, C++.
sometimes even see. Um, there are exceptions to that rule. Show of hands, who here has heard of Roller Coaster Tycoon? A couple of you. It is an older game. Um, probably about 15 to 20 years old at this point. I want to say. Maybe. Right? Anyway, that guy was crazy. It was written by one dude. And he wrote the entire program, the entire thing, in assembly. Which is basically one step above binary. That guy has a dedication that I can only admire, because that's crazy. Anyway, now, that's the fundamental sort of thing of object-oriented programming. What do I mean when I say inheritance? Well, we have this whole vehicle sort of class that we've created now. What if we wanted to create a car class? Well, we could say car inherits vehicle. We already created our vehicle class, right? Well, right here, car, because we've, we've, we've said these magic words, car inherits vehicle, or in JavaScript's case, extends, this program is going to automatically take all of the stuff that's in vehicle and apply it to car. So now a car has a color, a year, uh, a number of wheels. It's going to have, you know, the ability to turn on, turn off, move, um, all of that stuff, refuel, because we've told it that it inherits vehicle. Now, this is different from instancing an object, though. Because what we're doing is we're creating another template and basically copy-pasting all that stuff from our vehicle template. The fact that we've done that, though, means we can expand upon it. So now we can say car has all of that stuff in addition to the fact that it's going to have a honk horn function. And it's also going to have a, uh, let's see here, a... Um, a type of vehicle variable. So we can put in here, like, you know, maybe it's maybe it's an SUV. Maybe it's a coupe. Maybe it's a sports car. Maybe it's a minivan. Whatever. Um, we can expand upon that. So now it's going to have the turn on, turn off, move, and refuel functions, in addition to a honk horn function that the base vehicle won't have, because maybe that vehicle could be an airplane, and there's fewer things more useless than a horn on an airplane. Um, if you can hear an airplane's horn, you're already way too close. But um, it allows us to use a, a template that already exists and expand upon it to create a version of it that is more specific to something we want. So we could have, for instance, we can have a person class, and a person has, you know, a name and an age and a height, and, um, you know, they're going to have uh, a hair color and an eye color, and they're going to know how to be able to brush their teeth and tie their shoes and, you know, take a shower and all that stuff. But then we can inherit the person class for an employee class. Employees also have names and ages and heights and hair color and eye color and stuff like that. Uh, they also know how to brush their teeth and take a shower and, and tie their shoes. But in addition to that, an employee might know how to, you know, compile TPS reports. They might also know how to um, fix a computer. They might also have an employer ID number. They might have an hourly wage. Then uh, they might also have uh, uh, a, a job title, stuff like that. So they have additional stuff on top of the person templates, which is specific to them. You know, you might have a student class, which inherits from a person class, and that student class is going to have like a student ID number and a grade point average and the classes that they're taking this semester. And they're going to have uh, functions like stay up all night and try to study and freak out about next week's test and stuff like that. 
these it's not always going to be a perfect representation however it allows you to create representations of real world objects with as much generality or specificity as you so desire and then on top of that it allows you to create instances of all of these things so you can create an instance of a person you can create an instance of a student you can create an instance of an employee and all of them are going to have the variables and the functions that are specific to their class because say you wanted to create a person that is neither a student nor an employee well you can create an instance of the person class and they're going to have all the stuff in person but they're not going to have the stuff in student and they're not going to have the stuff in employee that is specific to those things because there are neither of those and that information would be useless to them likewise you can create a student it's going to have all the stuff in person and it's going to have all the stuff in student but it's not going to have the stuff in employee not that they're mutually exclusive necessarily a student can also be an employee but it's going to have the stuff that is directly applicable to them so when we say here in our scripting it extends panel this is an example of object-oriented programming panel has functions and variables specific to just that our script by extending it we can take advantage of all of that stuff and we can add our own functions on top of that which gr give it greater specificity that just a base panel wouldn't have like if we didn't have this script attached to it and we weren't extent like adding more stuff to it and we tried to do something to a panel that didn't have this script and it, we're, we were trying to do stuff that we added in our own script that you know to a regular basic old panel it wouldn't know what we were talking about because all it has is the panel stuff you'll see what I mean in a moment we'll actually get this up and running I promise you we will so let's spend some time looking at the actual script itself we've got one function here it's called ready now in Godot the ready function is something that is called on everything once per cycle so every time the computer asks our program to do a thing Godot goes okay yeah we can do that and it's gonna call all of the readies on all of the nodes that we have on the entire program you know that that's in scope right now basically it's in the scene and it's gonna run all of them which is awesome because it means that we can we can have a bunch of different things happening at the same time but it's also something to be aware of because we have a jillion nodes on the screen like a whole a hundred a whole bazillion modes um, nodes not modes hundred you know whatever an, an absurd number of nodes ready is going to be called on all of them and if we have scripting in all of their readies that does a whole bunch of different stuff it's probably going to slow the computer down now we're not going to see that until we have like a whole you know buttload of nodes but it's something to keep in mind it's something that can happen because it's just more computational time from the computer anyway we're gonna have one thing running our ready script it's gonna be this panel that's what we want we're gonna have the panel we're gonna modify the ready script of the panel and what we're gonna do is we're going to tell it to say a thing any time where the first time the button is pressed now because we're gonna have the thing that is said sent to the label and the button that we're checking is gonna be our button we wanted to make sure that they're both children of panel if they're children of panel then panel can ask them to do things and it can ask them for their status but only if they're children of panel not even if they're grandchildren or great grandchildren, then we'd have to then we'd have to pass it down the totem pole, pass it down the chain, ask ask you know if it was if it was like a grandchild a panel we'd have to ask panel's child, who was the parent of it, it. It starts to get more confusing from that point on. But since everything is a child right now of panel, we can just directly ask for its status and tell it to do stuff, and that's what we're gonna do here. 
there's this handy little function called get underscore node. What get node does is it requests information from a child node. We're going to get node button. So in this, in this case, we're going to ask for the information from button. This dude right here. Hi, computer. You are now alive. So panel is going to get the information from button. And we're going to say, uh, what is it? On, or connect, dot connect. We're going to ask for its status. We're going to say pressed. self on button pressed. Okay, so I just typed a whole bunch of stuff there. What happened? So dot connect is asking for its status. Basically telling it to do a thing on status. The status in this case is pressed. So anytime the button is pressed, this will trigger. Whose button? Well, itself. Anytime the button itself is in status pressed, we're going to enter the on button pressed function, which doesn't exist yet. That's okay. We're telling it that anytime this happens, we're going to enter on button pressed. So far, so good, right? Like, that makes sense? Hopefully. Hopefully it makes a little bit of sense. So we're asking it to, once the button is pressed, to run a function, right? Now, this is a bit of a problem because this function doesn't actually exist yet. We're going to need to create it ourselves. But that's fine. We have basically all the tools right here to see exactly how that's done. Because we have a function here, right? All we need to do is just sort of copy the the relevant things. That FUNC is short for function. That's a necessary thing. That tells the computer that what we're about to type in is going to be the name of a function. So that's going to be the name of our function. In this case, we want it to be on button pressed. The parentheses We'll, we'll go over the parentheses and stuff like that in the future. We don't really have enough time right now in order to do it. And then we need a colon. This basically means that everything after this colon is going to be a part of on button pressed, with one caveat, because JavaScript requires that anything that is set within that function to be indented. So as you can see, get node is indented, pass is indented, these comments are indented, that's what's telling us it's a part of ready. And we can tell by looking at these little double arrows right here. Those are a handy way to tell us that it's indented. So what we're going to do is we're going to have our next line be indented, which means it's going to be a part of on button pressed. Unsurprisingly, we're going to get note again, because this time we want to write something to the label, right? So once the button is pressed, we're going to, we're going to write something to the label. We're going to call. We're going to get node of. We're going to get the label node. That's what I'm trying to say. We're going to get the label node, and we're going to tell it to basically change the text. And that's done with a set text. It's a pretty you know straightforward name. So get node label dot set text. Now this dot is, I should say, an access modifier, which means that we're going to get the node of label, and then. Remember how I was saying that there are there is scripting built in to all of these things? There's scripting built into button, there's scripting built into label. What we're doing right now is we're accessing a function inside of label that allows us to set the text straight through the code. Just like we accessed a function inside of button that will tell us whenever the button is pressed. So what we're going to do is we're going to set the text here. We're going to be like, oh, hi, good to be alive. Uh, oh, hi, world. In all caps, because, you know, why not? 
so what we what this all, all the, the only thing this does is it sets the text to whatever's inside the parentheses. We have the double quotes because that's known as a literal. It just means that print this exactly as I tell you to. Exactly how I typed it. Print this to label. And that's it. This is our entire code, our entire script for this hello world. And it'll actually be correct this time, unlike last time, which I messed up. So I'm going to save this scene. I'm going to save it as a button scene, which is a thing we're going to have to do. We're going to have to save this scene. So once you guys are finished with the with the scripting, go ahead and save the scene and give it a useful name. I, I, I gave it the name button scene. You can call it hello world. You can call it first scene. You can call it my scene. You can call it a doy scene or something. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, generally helpful is better. But you can call it whatever you want. It's This one is button scene dot scn. Scn is short for scene. That's how the scenes, that's the, the file extension for scenes in Godot. So I'm going to hit save. Uh, if you just go up to scene and then save scene, or you can hit control S, it'll allow you to, uh, to save it. Now, once you guys have saved the scene, I want you to, to raise your hand because I want to show you something that's incredibly important to getting your program running. Uh, just give it a name. No worries. Uh, save the scene. Give it a name. Like if I go to save scene as it comes up with this window. And then give it a name and then hit save. But yeah, no problem. Hopefully we can get this... Uh... this last part done before uh, at least too much after 8 o'clock. So again, raise your, raise your hand once you've gotten that scene saved. Um, then once that's done, we'll go over this next step, which is actually pretty important. All right, so everybody except for a couple of people. Um, that's okay. We'll go ahead and, and get this so that we can we can get this thing up and running by the end of class. So now that you've saved your scene, we could try clicking the play button up here. It probably won't work well. And I'll tell you why. Because scenes, you can think of like levels. If you wanted to give it like a game analogy, you could you could create a level and save it as a scene. Create another level, save it as another scene. So on and so forth. We have to tell Godot what the first scene is. The scene that starts up when you first start the game. Because we could create the last scene first, and then you know go to the second one, and then the seventh one, and then the first one, and then the ninth one, and then the fourth one, and so on and so forth. There is nothing in there saying that the first scene we create is going to be the first scene we want showing in our game. So we have to tell Godot which one is going to be the first scene, otherwise it won't run. So if we go into Scene, up here in the upper left-hand corner, and then go down to Project Settings, you can see there's a whole bunch of different stuff up here. Um, this allows us to change, well, settings on our project, which applies across the entire project. Now, I've got something already here under main scene. You may or may not. But what we're going to do is we're going to select this scene that you just saved as our main scene. You can do that. Um, by either clicking the file here or typing it in manually. Um, but I'm going to make things easier, and I'm going to click the little folder icon next to it. Click the folder icon, you'll get a little drop-down menu that says File and then Clear. I'm going to click on File. Uh, I clicked on um, Scene and then Project Settings. All right, excellent. So under main scene, you can click the little folder next to it, 
in order to bring up this little drop down menu. It might not even be a drop down, like let me just go ahead and click that. See, there we go. You have file and then clear. So if I click on file, I get the little browser window, the little file browser, just like before. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the scene that I just saved. So in this case, for me, it's going to be button scene. For you, it's going to be whatever you named it. Just make sure that one's selected. And yes, hello, cat. And then hit open. And as you can see, main scene has been replaced with res colon forward slash forward slash button scene dot sen. Once that's done, you can hit close. And then you can hit the play button up here. And hey, this looks like our window. So if I hit high computer, you are now alive. It responds with whatever I wrote in the script. Oh, hi world, good to be alive. And there you go. That's your first, basically, hello world little program in Godot. Super, super simple. It may seem like it was a little bit more complex than it needed to be. You don't have that. Did it not start up for you, or did it just not say anything when you uh, clicked on the button? Tell you what, while you're typing out the answer, since it's after 8 o'clock, let's do like something else came up. Um, we'll address that in a moment. Let's do the poll questions for now. And, uh, and, then we'll, uh, and then I can help you out with that. I know it was a little bit, it was a little bit of repeat from, well, it was actually a lot of repeats from last time. Um, and it was a little bit faster, too, than it was last time around. 100%. And yeah, so I, you guys felt the same way. It was a little bit too fast. Things will be a little bit slower from here on out. And, uh, and the second question. All right, 80%. So 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Close. On the whole, though, you guys enjoyed it, which is good. But yeah, that does it for today. Um, I'll help you out with uh, what's whatever's going on, uh, Mikaela. We'll see if we can address that. Uh, for everybody else, if you have questions, you're more than welcome to hang out uh, for a bit. Otherwise, you're also more than welcome to head out. We'll meet again on Wednesday. Hey, no problem, John. It happens. <laughs> it's just a thing. Um, we'll, we'll meet up again on Wednesday, and we'll uh, we'll make a little bit more progress on this. So yeah.